People ask me, when am I going to turn around on Bitcoin? When will I admit that I was wrong? When will I admit the possibility that it actually is money or a viable gold derivative? My answer, I have a straight answer for that, and it's simple. During the next financial crisis, monetary crisis, banking crisis, they're all going to come together. When that is triggered, if Bitcoin can maintain stability in gold ounce terms, not in dollar terms, I don't care about dollars, if it can maintain stability in gold ounces, then I will admit that Bitcoin is a viable gold derivative and therefore not money itself, but a viable derivative of money which can be used in commerce. On the technical analysis side, silver price shows negative trades to move away and support the chances of continuing the expected bearish trend on the intraday basis. And the way is open to achieve the next target at $30.63, which represents 50% Fibonacci correction level for the rise from $26.41 to $34.85. Thus, breaking it will push the price to suffer additional losses that reach $29.64. Holding below $31.63 represents the first protection factor to the suggested negative scenario, as breaching it will lead the price to achieve intraday gains and test $32.86 before any new attempt to decline. Let's get back into the episode. With this week's Silver Report, and there is, once again, a lot to talk about, a lot of exciting stuff going on, mostly in the political arena. What is the world going to look like if RFK is in charge of health and human services? What is the world going to look like if Matt Gates is attorney general? These are the questions that are exciting me, but I have to talk about metals and Bitcoin because I am now certain that this is a deep state psyop, that Bitcoin is designed to take good, healthy, liberty feelings and thoughts and rush them into the garbage and burn it. It's not me saying this. The deep state and the banksters are saying this outright in pure, clear language that Bitcoin is used to fund the government deficit and to spread U.S. inflation out into the world on unsuspecting third world countries in the same way that America has financed itself since 1971, abusing the reserve currency status of the dollar. Don't take my word for it. Just listen to Howard Lutnick, head of Cantor Fitzgerald, at this Bitcoin conference, saying it out loud. Market distribution of USD Tether is fundamental for backing our debt in our country, which helps us live in this beautiful way. Tether is backed by U.S. Treasuries, which back the U.S. dollar, which is what you redeem Tether for, which is used to buy Bitcoin, which is backed by Tether, which is backed by U.S. Treasuries, which back the U.S. dollar, and so on. This is a spiral of monetary nothingness spinning in the air. And when you buy gold and silver, what you're doing is you're taking that money and you're taking it out of the merry-go-round. When you buy Bitcoin, you are just stimulating the price of treasuries and you are spreading U.S. inflation all over the world and you are continuing the power for the deep state, which is why they do not care how high Bitcoin goes. Believe me, they care about how high gold and silver go because that is the antithesis of their inflationary project that is about to end. They can let Bitcoin go higher and higher and higher because the higher it goes, the more money, the more dollars are stuffed into it as a receptacle for inflation. And the more treasuries Tether has to buy because the way you buy Bitcoin is you use Tether. The USDT BTC trading pair is the biggest trading pair in the crypto space by far. But when you buy physical gold, there is no possible way that you are funding the deep state. This is just the truth. And I realize that people don't want to accept it. But that's what it is. In today's news recap, silver price drops to nearly two-month low, 100-day SMA breakdown in play. Silver attracts some follow-through selling during the Asian session on Thursday and drops to its lowest level since September 19th in the last hour. Bearish traders now await a sustained break below the $30 psychological mark before positioning for an extension of the recent sharp retracement slide from a 12-year peak touched last month. 
The overnight close below the 50% Fibonacci retracement level of the August-October rally and a subsequent break through the 100-day simple moving average for the first time since September could be seen as a fresh trigger for bearish traders. Moreover, oscillators on the daily chart have been gaining negative traction and are still away from being in the oversold zone. This in turn suggests that the path of least resistance for silver price remains to the downside and supports prospects for a further depreciating move. The white metal might then accelerate the fall towards the 61.8% FIBO level around the $29.65 to $29.60 region. The downward trajectory could extend further towards the $29.20 to $0.25 area before eventually breaking below the $29 mark and tests a technically significant 200-day SMA currently pegged near the $28.65 zone. On the flip side, any meaningful recovery attempt might now confront a stiff barrier near the $30.60 region. Some follow-through strength, however, could trigger a short covering rally and allow for silver to reclaim the $31 mark, though the momentum is more likely to remain capped near the 31.20 support turned resistance. The latter should act as a key pivotal point, which if cleared decisively will suggest that the commodity has formed a near term bottom and paved the way for additional gains. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first, smash the subscribe button, hit the like button, and send a super thanks if you find our daily recaps valuable. Enjoy the episode. Bitcoin has rocketed all the way back up to about 36 ounces of gold per Bitcoin. It is backed off again. Now it's at 34.07. That's the latest chart here. It looks like we have a potential triple top in play here. And though I'm not a technical trader, I do know that triple tops, if they hold, are devastating for the assets that print this pattern, even gold and silver themselves. You remember this triple top in gold from 2011 to 2012? Well, it was about $1,800. And that triple top held and started a bear market in precious metals for four years. That went down 50% for gold, almost 50%. And it was a brutal bear market that actually did hold through. And many people did not. But if you remember that bear market, it was vicious. But if we continue on to the gold market this week, we can see that in the past few weeks, actually since the end of October, when gold topped at about $2,800, the price has been hit pretty hard. We're down to about $2,570 now, $2,573, whatever it is when you watch this. Uh, it is a substantial decline, but notice what is happening in open interest. It has not declined much at all. It went down from about a high of 580,000, 585,000, somewhere around the end of October to now about 542,000. It's a little bit higher than this number. This is on a one day delay. Open interest is not budging, which means that the banks are not covering their shorts at these prices. Could be that they open them at even lower prices than they are now, or they opened them a while ago. If open interest is not declining into this substantial price decline as it usually does, as it should. We see here, for example, that there was a local high at around 2,500, 2,450 or something in gold in July, and it went down to about 2,350, only about $100, $150 of a correction there, much less than we see now, even by percentage. And open interest fell from about 600,000, higher than it was at the recent peak here, to about 460,000 or so. That was a substantial decline. This time that is not happening. Somebody is stuck in their short positions and they cannot cover. Next slide, we see the 10 year minus three month yield curve spread. Also the 10 year minus two year yield curve spread. We see that they go in tandem and we are almost normalized on the blue line, which is the 10 year minus three month. We're at 14 basis points negative, could be somewhere between five and 14 basis points. It changes by the hour. We're about to cross into normalization territory. And you can see on the gray strips here, the Keynesian style recessions that took place in 1991, in 2001, 
and 2008 and 2020, shortly after the yield curve is normalized on both of these spreads. Well, that is about to happen, especially considering the higher inflation, price inflation numbers. And once that does cross, we only have a few months until we get to the next financial crisis, because financial crises always coincide with the Keynesian style recession. And the more money that gets cleared out and the higher the inflationary cycle goes, the more vicious these financial crises are. And it will be the most vicious that we have ever seen because the credit bubble that is currently being blown up is the biggest that has ever been blown up in human history. Meanwhile, the Fed did cut interest rates this week, or was it last week? Whenever it was, I don't quite remember, nor do I really care that much. But anyway, QT accelerates due to rate cut. This is the weekly movement of the Fed's balance sheet. We can see here that it is down $27 billion, $191 billion. Now, if you mouse over this, this is a picture of it, but if you go to the FRED website and you mouse over this weekly movement in the Fed's balance sheet, you will see that for five weeks straight, the balance sheet has declined at an accelerating pace, right? Every week it declines by more dollars than the week before. This is five straight weeks. This is the longest streak since they slowed down quantitative tightening in June. Why is QT accelerating? Because of the bank term funding program, which is being zeroed out because the rate cuts mean that the rates that they took out, these banks took out the bank term funding program, which is the regional bank bailout. The rates that they got on that program are now higher than the Fed's interest rate. So they have to close out these loans and return the money to the Fed, which takes it out of existence, which accelerates quantitative tightening. You can see here, the bank term funding program fell by about $30 billion last week, which is the biggest weekly drawdown ever for the bank term funding program. And this is what has accelerated quantitative tightening and brought the Fed's balance sheet down by about $30 billion. You can see here, um, this is the what's left of the bank term funding program, $26.4 billion left. That is $26.4 billion that could clear out by next week and still continue to accelerate quantitative tightening into the next week or two. We can see here on a close-up what has actually been happening to the Fed's balance sheet. This is from the H41 report. We can see that securities held out right, which includes treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, the chief crap that's on the Fed's balance sheet that actually went up by $97 million. But what is causing the shrinkage in the balance sheet? That is loans, which includes the bank term funding program, $28 billion, $437 million, sorry, yeah, $28 billion, $437 million less than last week, bringing the Fed's balance sheet down by $27.19 billion. As this is happening, 10-year yields are about to break through their downtrend line, uh, which is being touched right now. If we get to 4.5, 4.6, the 10-year yield will break through. Why do I think it will break through? And long-term bond yields are headed higher because 30-year bond yields have already broken through. And now the trend line is appearing or appears to be support rather than resistance. We're at 4.6% here on the far out long-term curve. Also suggesting an imminent liquidity crunch is the US dollar at major resistance. Right, breakthrough suggests liquidity crunches in, and it hasn't broken through yet. But if we break through these levels decisively at about 107, if we get to 108, 109, we can assume that a liquidity crunch is just ahead because that means that dollar demand is rising and people need dollars, international players need dollars to pay their dollar denominated debt, which suggests a dollar shortage is gained. And there you have it gold and silver navigating through volatility and Bitcoin continuing to make waves. As Rafi Farber pointed out, these markets are shifting rapidly, reflecting the growing uncertainty and opportunities in today's economy. What do you think? Are precious metals still the ultimate safe haven or is Bitcoin stealing the spotlight? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more insights and updates. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. You